Again, it's my pleasure to be here and to share experiences that we've had in the last year or so, especially with PED. Yes, there is a correlation between these two viruses, but you're going to see a, you're going to see a similarity on how we've approached PED from what we learned the hard way from PERS. And we have two vaccines today. We've just now started to farrow some vaccinated sows. So we don't really understand what these vaccines are going to do for us, if anything, at this point. OK. What I'd like to talk about, especially with PED, is going to be some epidemiology, transmission. What does this disease, what does this virus cost us? Now remember, we never had it before, so the entire sow herd in the United States was naive. Immunity, what we know, what we're still struggling to get our arms around. You heard our last speaker talk about, he didn't put it in these terms, but pre-exposure. We've also learned the hard way that pre-exposure allows us to have better performance when pigs get exposed to viruses like PERS. We're going to talk about that. How we are developing protective immunity to PED. And then, of course, we can't have one of these talks without some biosecurity. First, I'd like to start with this slide because it represents what we experienced in the United States as well. We're moving protein all over the world. It's coming and going nearly every day. Well, guess what? We're also moving pathogens. And with that, we've got to be very, very careful with how we handle some of these products. And we're going to touch on this from a feed standpoint. But this summer, in Cancun, Mexico, there was an international swine meeting called International Pig Veterinary Society. And the keynote speaker was Dr. John Harding from Canada. He did a very wise thing. He sent an email out to as many veterinarians all over the world that he had access to. And he asked the question of us practitioners to rank pathogens one, two, and three. And this is what he got back from 300 veterinarians in the fact that PERS and PED rank one and two from an economic standpoint. So we're talking about the most important viruses when, it, when we look at something globally. Now, in your part of the world, you've got some other pathogens you've got to worry about too, classical swine fever, foot and mouth, and so forth. One of the first experiences that I had with high path PERS was in 2011 on this finishing site. These pigs were about 150 days old and it devastated them. So I know personally what high path PERS can mean to everybody in this room. And I went on to list some of the clinical signs that w we observed, high fever, pigs didn't eat, they had difficulty breathing. And of course, when it got into the sow unit, the abortions and dead sows was pretty severe. We see this also in North America. In some of the strains, some of the isolates of PERS can be just as damaging. When you walk into a 5,000 sow unit and there's, in a week's period of time, there's over 200 dead sows, the house is on fire and you've got to stop it. And so this is part of what, how we've learned how to do some of these things. There is a little bit of confusion, even for us in America. We started out calling this, uh, when PED started to break in the Midwest, we call it novel swine enteric corona disease, S-E-C-D. Today, we basically just call it PED, and I'll show you why. We also have, a, we actually have three coronaviruses that we did not have before. We have two strains, two different kinds of PED, one predominant strain. The other one is Delta coronavirus. And we just shorten that word down to Delta. 
This is what it looks like in sows, and they're just totally listless. And of course, it causes a lot of death loss in, in small baby pigs because of the vomiting, the diarrhea, the body changes its pH, it becomes very acidic, and these little guys just can't live through that. So how do we handle something that was new? Well, we fell back to working with a, another coronavirus for many, many years called TGE. TGE, Delta Corona, and PED all look identical when they first start to have clinical signs in a sow farm. You can't tell them apart, but there is quite a bit of difference. And of course, I like to remind all of my clients that this is not a food safety issue. It doesn't infect us. It's just strictly in pigs. Now, it's not a new disease for the world. This is a nice chart to show that it started in Europe, basically England, in the 70s. By the 80s, Japan had PED. Of course, the Koreans have had it since the 90s, then China. But again, there was something different in China a few years ago, kind of reemerged for some reason. Maybe it's changed or it continues to change. And then we started to see it in 2013. One thing that got the attention of the politicians in our country was this disease because we were looking for solutions. And so as of June of this past summer, it is now a reportable disease, meaning that when I take a sample, I send it into the laboratory and it's positive, I have to put on my submission form the premise ID. The premise ID is a identification that our state governments give each a swine site, cattle site, and you may only have five pigs or you may have 5,000 pigs, you still have to have a premise ID today. And so this goes back to, from the diagnostic lab, that information goes back to the state, and then we have communications with the state. If it's the first time and we have not only the clinical symptoms and we get a positive PED back, I have to fill out a herd plan for that site, be it a nursery finisher site, wean to market site, or sow site. So that's kind of changed in how we handle this disease. Not all of my clients want the government to know that they're positive. So we have some situations at, time, at times. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how fast this virus moved across the pig producing states in the United States. So this is April, May calendar of 2013. You can see locations in Iowa, quite a few miles between these sow units. We had a break in Indiana and also in Colorado. Just stop a minute and think, how did a virus move to all these different geographic sites so quickly? This is going to illustrate it a little differently, and you're going to see this forest fire that we, we dealt with. I'm going to have a date here, and then I'll show the different states and how quickly positive cases were happening. So for this illustration, I'm just going to use April the 15th, two sites in Ohio. Then suddenly two weeks, within the next two weeks, we had two sites in Indiana. We had three sites in Iowa. Now, the more positive sites, the bigger the circle. And it just explodes. And you, so you begin to wonder, how are we going to stop this? And it also pretty much picked on all, this, all the areas in the United States that raise pigs. This again is a different kind of map, but you've seen it a couple of times today where the pigs are raised. I'm going to focus on Oklahoma because that was the first time that we started to get a little appreciation for variation. The clinical presentation is not always the same when you sit back and you look at the whole herd. In fact, talking to my colleagues, it even jumped over some sites, 
somehow it moved across the site and never infected it. So that's when we started to think about biosecurity and trying to understand if I have a sow farm break, what's going to happen? And I can, I can assure you that biosecurity works. Our first sow herd that broke the end of November last year had two employees that had their own sow farm. One had five sows, the other one had 20 sows. We developed a program for those two employees. They never carried this virus to their sow farms, their little sow farms. It was a hobby farm. They were scared to death because of the amount of money. They, they were raising pigs to be able to sell into the show arena for us. We have this activity. It's a, it's a hobby for a lot of clients where they raise a few pigs, they take them to shows all summer long. And we call them the show pigs or exhibition pigs. But we were able not to move it. And I thought that was really fascinating. If I can do that, why can't I eliminate this virus from some sites? You've seen this chart. Jim Lowe did an excellent job of describing this. It's a, it's a statistical technique where you weight the more recent outbreaks versus the older outbreaks. So you can look at outbreaks over time and get an appreciation for incidents. And then you can do a smooth line over those outbreaks, which clearly shows us when the incident problem was happening. Now in our practice, it started the very end of November, 1st of December, and it's continued. As of the middle of April, we had stopped all the outbreaks, even in the grow finish barns. But it started to pick up just two or three weeks ago. So it's coming again. Now I really like this type of statistical look at a disease because I I can understand very clearly this threshold line that's developed from all these data points. If you break above the threshold line, then it's more like an epidemic. The forest fire again that Jim Lowe showed us. If it stays below, it's more endemic. The virus hasn't went away. We've, we've got it forever now. How are we going to keep it down here? Well, as it loves cold weather, as everybody knows, so we're starting to see it again in a few cases. This is the graph that Jim showed on PERS as well. Now we have not had very many PERS outbreaks or PERS activity since we started to clamp down on PED. And I do believe it's because of the types of biosecurity that we've put in place. We're working with feed mills to Swiffer test in the mill on a monthly basis only to do two things. We're not trying to have early detection with this. We're just trying to say, you know, is the mill doing what they can, number one, to help prevent disease transmission? And secondly, it's an education that the mill people are part of the team. And we'll talk a little bit about feed in just a minute. This is another way to look at uh, disease incidents over time by year. This was last year. We did not have as many breaks. We're already starting to uh, experience some this year. I really like this chart because it graphically shows and talks about pre-exposure, which I think is one of the most important things when it comes to PERS in controlling PERS. This is work that J.P. Kano, when he was at the University of Minnesota, in his PhD work was able to show so we have a naive pig, a pig that's never seen PERS virus before. It gets infected. Well, there's just a few things that we have to know as practitioners if we want to get ahead of this, of, of this virus. One is that antibodies from exposure are going to take a few days, almost two weeks, before I can sample that animal and use an ELISA test but I can use PCR within a day. So you, know, you got to know the different diagnostic tests and how to use them. Now, there's virus in the blood for anywhere from two weeks to five weeks. There's, that pig is shedding virus out of every opening in its body. And because of that, we know from 
science has shown us that it doesn't stay inside that building. It blows outside through the ventilation fans. And if the, and if the air temperature, wind speed, humidity, everything's right, it's going to move to its neighbors. Shedding on a naive pig can, can occur for nearly three months. So you ask the question, what can I do to shorten this time period? I'm not going to get the forest fire under control unless I can do something to shorten this time period. If we vaccinate that pig, like here, previously exposed pig, we vaccinate it, then it gets infected with field virus, we get an antibody response much quicker. It's viremic period, maybe almost nothing to two weeks, and I've got shedding down to a month or less. And in the ARC projects, the one that I've particularly worked with the most, we're accomplishing something on a geographic basis that's kind of neat. And in talking to Dr. Lee, um, what they're doing in Korea is also pretty exciting. We're not just looking at the site and characterizing it. We're looking at the loca location around that site, and then we're looking at a geographic area when it comes to minimizing disease. How do we do that? Well, one thing is using vaccine to shorten the amount of shedding. Now, you have to support a lot of that with some management changes as well, such as load, close, expose, or load, close, homogenize. We use those terms interchangeably. Mike Murtall had a study, John Waddell's study, that looked at large number of pigs. What came out of that, that study is five or six, it's probably seven years old now. What came out of it is three more very key studies that look at large number of pigs, either a side-by-side -side or before and after type of approach, and clearly shows in all cases that vaccination gives us that ROI, that return on investment that Jim talked about. But what I'd really like to point out is how young veterinarians like this Dr. Clayton Johnson has taken this information coming out of University of Minnesota, looking at his system and putting the economics towards that and saying, okay, what do I need to do to make a change here? And out of that is the comments that Dr. Lowe spoke about. If that sow herd breaks more often or every other year, then we're just gonna go for control. We're not gonna eliminate because the money isn't there to support that kind of thing. You're also gonna hear us in America talk about time to stabilization and time to baseline production. And I've got some charts that are gonna talk about baseline production and how we're using that. This is one of the studies Jose Angulo has, was the main author on it, I guess, and it was published, uh, IPVS, in 2012. Clearly illustrates one other aspect that we don't talk about very often. If you take a large system and you apply vaccine, what's going to happen to the number of wild virus strains in that system? You're going to reduce them. That's a positive. You're going to have less wild strains there. So before they started the vaccination, there was 100% of the time, there was, it was only wild type. Afterwards, roughly 50% of the time. So there you're, you're reducing the amount of challenge that you have to deal with, very important. And then to support what's already been said on an economic basis, if you wanna look at nurseries or finishers, every time we see improvements. In mortality, sometimes not so much, but in the days to market, it's almost always there. And that's what I challenge each and every one of the producers here in this room today. If you're only looking at mortality, you don't have the full equation. It's easy to figure out days to market, either in a nursery or a finisher situation. Monitor that as well. And you'll find that that's where a lot of the economics come in for the improvement. This was a nice study 
Dr. Zimmerman talked to us about this technique of looking at epidemiology in an area. This was at the Lehman Conference, and he did a really nice job of looking at risk of disease and that disease spread in specific directions from a positive unit. He also looked at what it meant one week post-exposure, two weeks, and three weeks, and the amount of exposure would decrease with time. So the animals, the population, is developing immunity. That's going to slow down the amount of virus that's being shed. There is one thing I want to say about PED virus. I've practiced 35 years, and this virus is the most, what's the word I want to use here? outstanding or unusual as it persists in the environment. We've went into wean to finish barns and nursery finisher sites and cleaned them up. And I can still get PCR positive test results after the second washing of a room, the second disinfectant, and the second drying. And this can be off of feeders. Now, the test is not showing very much virus. We have not done a bioassay on it. I don't think it's really infectious. We put pigs into those sites. So we're treating it a lot like PERS. We do a partial depop. So we have exposed pigs on this farm. We've got an empty set of rooms. And then we have clean pigs, naive pigs, moving right through the system. And we walk it right off, right off the site. But that's after we made an attempt to expose all those pigs on that site so we had immunity. And it's, and it's been working. It's been fascinating. The other thing, PED, there is uh, one study out of Oklahoma that looked at area spread of PED. And there were some indications that it spread up to 10 miles, but the virus was not alive. I've had the experience from one client to the next I'm sure it can go a mile, depending on the outside weather conditions. And that's kind of what this study was showing as well. Now, talk about how this virus persists has been amazing. We can do, we can find PCR positives in the water on top of a pit or the lagoon eight months after the break. And yet, when I do my environmental testing inside the unit, I don't find any virus. So it's persisting in manure. We don't think it's infectious. We think it's only infectious for four months or so. And that's part of why we close these sow units for four months. We bring all the replacement gilts in that we can. The other thing is it does not take very much virus to infect a naive herd. Very, very small amounts of virus. And you can walk that in on your clothes. What we're, I'll start to talk about feed in just another slide, but we're, we're looking at feed now. We're looking at everything that enters a sow unit as being able to carry pathogens. And that's been a huge change in how we practitioners in the United States have been thinking. We never really thought about the feed that much before. But before I do that, let's look at the economics of this thing. Rabble Bank in May, came out and said 60%, they predicted 60% of the sow herds in the United States would break. Well, we kept it down below that, thank goodness. But we did see a 7% reduction in, the, in pigs that went to market this summer and fall. Steve Meyer is an economist that I really like to read, and he shared this slide with me. He's put this together over time. And you can see about late 2006, we started to get serious about weaning more pigs per litter. We were on a very, very nice incline until PED. And it put us, <laughs> it set us back on our heels. Now, let's, what about cross protection? This is a very nice paper that came out this summer looking at an old virus for us, TGE virus, one that uh, in the 80s come in as porcine respiratory coronavirus. Well, genetically on this dendrogram, they're very, very closely related. The hypothesis is because we have this, we have less TGE. 
And I think that's true. Well, I had some unfortunate experiences where we might have broke with Delta coronavirus first, and a month, six weeks, eight weeks later, the poor guy broke with PED, or it might be just the opposite. We had a couple of units that only experienced Delta corona. And those viruses are vastly different in the economic cost on a farm. So there's no cross protection, or it doesn't appear to be cross protection between these two viruses today. I like this schematic because it shows the spike genes and the membrane genes. Now I mentioned the fact that we have two conditional licensure vaccines in America. One, the Harris Labs vaccine only has the spike genes. The Zoetis conditional licensure has both the membrane and the spike genes. So we're testing to find out if they're going to work and if so, what is our expectations after using them. But our program has been this. We have excellent diagnostic labs. We can get a diagnosis within 24 hours unless it's a weekend. So that was our first goal. As soon as there was clinical signs, clients were calling us. We had samples into the lab. In the meantime, we were talking through with them how to collect, what to collect, and we started to develop the material that we wanted to use to feed back to that sow herd. We would take a sample of that feedback material if the sow herd was not stable. So we, if we had some purrs moving around in that sow herd, we'd take and send that in to make sure we didn't have purrs in our feedback. Now you can throw this feedback material in plastic containers, put it in the freezer, and it lasts for several months. It's still infectious. We'd try to get all the replacement gilts in within a week for the next four months. We started to review with all the farm staff and owners about external biosecurity. We fed those sows back usually three days, three consecutive days. Sometimes there was weekends, we jumped a day or two but in between, but we tried to feed them back three times. The reason we selected three times is only because of biological variation. We wanted to make sure every sow was exposed to enough virus. Now, we really didn't know how much virus at that point, so that's how we came up with three. And the goal was to observe those sows. We wanted 90% of the sows to show some kind of clinical sign, be it off feed, diarrhea, or both. And then we then immediately began to work on the internal biosecurity. We didn't start that until about 10 days, two weeks after we had everybody exposed we had the farm staff educated where we started to clean. We have never cleaned sow units like we have in the last 18 months. It's been amazing. Lactogenic immunity. Basically, that's what's protection in the, for the baby pig. And of course, lactogenic means it's in the milk. We know that oral exposure creates protection in these, for these baby pigs. We're trying to get our arms around how to use the vaccines that are killed to see if we can have protection. Now that might mean that we still don't vaccinate in naive herds, but we're gonna vaccinate in some of the exposed herds. We're still working through that. Again, duration of immunity looks like it's four months, possibly a little longer in some cases. But there is going to be a little variation depending on the site. And this comes into play because we have a small number of clients that have elected to constantly feed back. We had one client that was feeding back on a weekly basis and I tried to get him to stop. And he did break with PED this fall. And again, you got to remember what you're doing on the site. What, what is happening to the population? So the others that wanted to feed back, we went with a population approach, just like we've talked about today with PERS. That seems to work the best. I can show you charts of how often we're feeding back, and I think in most cases we fed back too often. So I'm look, we're looking at quarterly. This fall, we're talking to clients about uh, biosecurity. Basically, we have five categories. 
Feed is going to be the number one that's on everybody's mind in America. We are using Swiffer test. We're going into the bins on the outside storage bins. We're Swiffering the dust, not the feed, just the dust that surrounds that bin that's above the feed. In some cases, we're finding PCR positives and relatively low, 28, 29, 31 is kind of the range that we'll find it. And that's pretty typical of an environmental sample. Transport, I think, is still going to be our number one transmission issue. We started Swiffer testing trucks, trailers, cabs, you name it. And it really involved and engaged truckers into the cleaning process. It allowed us to talk to them about the education and how to do this properly. This has been one of the biggest changes for us when it comes to fomites. Basically, that's just a fancy term that means anything that comes onto the farm. Boxes, bags, whatever. And we'll cover that in just more in a minute. Manure management is an activity that's going on right now. A lot of my clients have built these kind of sheds where we compost the deads. The afterbirth, baby pigs, sows, whatever. And we found very early that on the top of the pile, it got so warm, so hot, there wasn't any virus. But in the fluid down around the base of the compost pile, there was plenty of virus. And again, that's just part of our environmental sampling. On the feed, we have clients doing a couple of different things. And the feed companies have really got involved with this and helped become, and they've actually become leaders in helping us find alternatives to animal protein like spray dried plasma. If a client doesn't want to feed it for whatever reason, we've got alternatives today. And we're also looking at DDGSs as a possible in ingredient that might be bringing in some of these pathogens at times. A new, and I'm not sure how quite to um, talk about this, but this chemical treatment, it's been done in poultry rations for a long time, I guess. It's a formaldehyde acid combination product. Uh, Sow Curb is one from Kimmon that comes to mind. We have another company that makes a similar product. It, uh, and the Pipestone people have done a kind of a concept uh, study and clearly has shown that it, it does kill PED virus over a course of a few days. Transport, we're not necessarily asking our transport people to have a TAD system to super dry these trailers. If you give me an overnight with a little bit of air moving, moving and warm, there's no virus on these, on these trucks. So with the people and the fomites, we bought bio sheds, we put them out by the road so that we do not have deliveries and the delivery people walking right into the office of the pig unit. We've put in fumigation rooms. Um, we're looking at disinfectant maps to, mats to walk on as we enter the unit, or if we have to step outside the unit, we're disinfecting those boots, we're changing boots, we're using shoe covers. So when I drive up to a unit, I get out at the road, we spray the tires off, I swing my feet out of my car, put these sh booties on, and walk into the unit. So those are the kind of things that we've changed and it's, and it's been helping. This is basically education. How do we clean up units or these equipment that goes from one unit to the next unit? And that's been tough, but we're making some headway there. And we've talked about what we're doing with mortality cases. You know, at the end of the day, though, we've got to feed these pigs. We've got to keep that in mind. We put in too many constraints, and the pigs won't get fed. So in the last 10, 12 months, we've learned a lot about the risk of feed and what it might mean. We're trying to come up with some way to do bioassays on a fairly inexpensive method on farms. If the question is there, if I do a, a sample of their pit and I find virus, and it's got a lot of virus, then I want to put it through a bioassay, which means I've got to put it through a baby pig or pigs to find out if it's going to cause disease. We still don't know where the virus came from, but it, we have it and we've got to work with it. Some clients are buying their feed and putting it into a heated shop or shed, 
and set, letting it set for two weeks, three weeks before they use it, that also helped us last winter. What are we really talking about when it comes to PERS and PED interactions? This is similar to what two other speakers have talked to us today. There is a lot of confusion, but let's just take PERS. We have the human factor, the people taking care of the pigs. We have environmental issues. Do you have a single site, multi-site? How are you moving pigs? Genetically, some pigs respond better than others. What about mycotoxins? And then we're talking about viruses like influenza and PERS that are not stable. They're going to continue to mutate if we give them that opportunity. So we have virus variation. All of that leads to confusion for you and I. And what we had to do to understand this is basically called evidence-based medicine. As practitioners, if the process is not working, let's come up with a different way. But you've got to monitor it. And there's your records and everything else, the diagnostics that come into play. Talking about variation, I'm going to show you 12 sow farms, different size farms, different locations geographically. I think there's three states, Michigan, Indiana, Iowa, and Illinois. So there's four states involved here. This is looking at pre-break. What was their production pre-break? Put all the farms on the same timetable for breaking because the question the owners had, okay, I got PED, how quick can I get back to weaning pigs? The reason is we experienced the highest price on market hogs that we've ever had in the United States this past summer. These owners knew that if they had a loss of pigs, that was going to cost them a lot of money. Some went out and purchased pigs to fill in the hole. Others chose not to. So we looked at this, and there's a lot of variation. We have some farms, a couple of thousand sow farms, that only lost two weeks worth of pigs. And all the viruses sequence the same. Now, if we put that on a single line, you can start to appreciate what happens. This is the pre-break. How quickly did we come back to baseline when we put all the farms together? So then we started to play around with SPC charting with this. And SPC charting is statistical process control. So you, the, the computer, the software develops the, the mean. This would be the mean from this data point to this data point. And then there's one standard deviation above and below the mean, two and three. And of course, this is called Six Sigma. It was really refined in the auto industry in Japan. And now we kind of grabbed it for agriculture. But I like it because it takes biological noise out of production records. Now for us, this was the break. We created this data point by weaning pigs down to nine days of age. As soon as we had the clinical signs, the next day we had those pigs out of that unit. It's a lot of work, but you save pigs. And so this was outside of three sigma. That's the number one indicator that the process changed. Well, the process changed because of infection, health. And then it takes us almost eight weeks, about seven and a half to eight weeks to get back to baseline production. Now clinically, after four weeks, there's very little diarrhea. We've got immunity in those cells. We're working on internal biosecurity and we're reducing that exposure that's been talked about already today. We lost 1,200 pigs for every 1,000 sows. That's a loss. But when we compare that to a naive PERS break, naive farm on PERS breaks with a severe strain of PERS, we can lose up to 2,500 pigs. So it's half of PERS at this point. Now we can change this a lot on, on farms by vaccinating. Well, let's look at two of the other coronaviruses. The last TGE break we had was in 2000, February of 2013 in a 2600 farm, and we came back to baseline production within five weeks. The Delta coronaviruses 
we just don't hardly lose any pigs. They scour, they dehydrate, but if we give them supportive care, we can keep those pigs alive. So it's really important that you understand what virus you're dealing with. And then if you have PERS virus in your feedback material, guess what? We just spread it. PED did surprise us in, in the United States. We weren't ready. Secondly, we weren't ready to understand the, the feed component of transmission and how this all worked. But we have really good things to talk about as well. All of the major players, the veterinarians, the pork, uh, the pork producers, the diagnostic labs, the USDA came together and started to help us understand doing trials, providing money for us to understand how to get this virus under control. Most of my clients went for elimination, and I would say after the first winter, we're about 80 to 85 percent successful with eliminating virus. Now we've got to keep it out for those that are trying to do that. And then we talked about constant exposure. There was one method. I had two sow farms that uh, wanted to do a planned exposure. You know, as you get a little gray hair and you lose your hair as a practitioner, you got to come up with some really unique things sometimes. And so I asked this one producer, he'd broken his finishing site and his sow site was clinically negative. We did some testing, we couldn't find virus. And I said, what if we take three weeks worth of sows out of gestation, take them down to finisher, expose them, do our biosecurity so we don't carry this back to the sow unit, get some immunity in these sows, bring them back and feral them. You know, we lose less than two weeks worth of pigs. You got a lot of staging there to do, but it works. So we have two farms that did that, and it's pretty successful. The other thing I want to mention on this area regional control projects is the communication between the clients. It was fantastic to watch them. You know, if they break with a disease, be it whatever, they're calling their neighbors and saying, hey, maybe you don't want to drive down this road for right now. This is the status that I have. And this is what we're doing. The sharing from producer to producer got veterinarians involved, and it's really a positive event. I just want to leave you with the fact that in the midst of the firestorm, it doesn't look like you're going, to, you're, you're going to just jump off the cliff. Well, there is life after PED. With that, I want to thank you.